Hi, welcome to class 10, Integration and Verification. As we do with all our classes, we start off with the quote of the day. Um, actually, I've been reading this book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, lately. It's a very interesting book, more philosophical than anything else. Uh, but he does get into what does it mean to be a system and how do you look at a system. Uh, as a matter of fact, at one point, he does say that traditional scientific method has always been, at the very best, a 2020 hindsight. It's good for seeing where you've been. It's good for uh, testing the truth of what you think you know, but it can't tell you where you ought to go. Uh, what I like about uh, his uh, complaint with scientific method is the fact that you can have almost too many, well, you can have too many hypotheses, and therefore, how can you actually know the hypothesis you have is the truth? And also, science can't tell you where or what you should be studying. That's something you have to do in your own head. Uh, the other thing is Patrick Henry, of course, one of our famous uh, revolutionary heroes. He said, for my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I'm willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst and provide for it. Uh, and if you think about this quote in relationship to what we're going to talk about today, which is verification, uh, then you can get a sense that sometimes you want to know exactly what the truth will look like uh, when you actually do your verification and to make means to correct whatever you find is uh, wrong. All right. So well, this is week 10. Uh, we've already had about uh, nine weeks as well as your midterm exam. We have a few more classes to go after this. Um, as you can see, we're, we're doing fairly well here. Uh, you should be uh, uh, getting ready uh, for the TRR, so to get ready for that. So this is lecture 10. What we're going to do today is we're going to actually cover revisiting the implementation aspects that we did last week, but only real fast uh, to cover what how ISO 15288, uh, the System Engineering International System Engineering Standard. We're also going to get into integration and verification, as well as look at uh, T&E test and evaluation from DOD's perspective. So as we get started, let's, let's look at where implementation falls within the V-chart. Of course, it's on the very bottom where you come up with your verification requirements and then you start uh, fabricating or procuring the vis-a-vis uh, uh, the, -vis the requirements that you've had. Now, there are times you build and code to whatever design spec there. We talked about this last week. Your configuration item usually has four characteristics. It has a defined functionality. It can be replaceable as an entity. It can be a unique spec and it has a formal control of the form, fit, and function. This is hardware, software, or even a composite item. And also, as you're thinking about trying to uh, develop these, uh, if you do build and code to the design specs to create these, configuration items, you do need to think about what kind of enabling systems you have to have in place, be it a software development environment or hardware manufacturing tools or facilities in order to help you make the software or hard hardware. And of course, you need to think about uh, verifying once the unit is uh, at the point where the, it's an actual living configuration item or you need to think about software uh, unit tests or hardware uh, conformance to the drawings. In other words, you take the blueprints out, measure them, measure the actual device, does it match? But there may be times you feel your company actually can't or it's not cost effective to actually build or code uh, the configuration item that you're interested in. You may want to actually buy it. So if you do that, you have to start thinking about an acquisition process where you're trying to get a supplier to get what you need 
and therefore you need to prepare you know you need to think about how that spec will look to a supplier so you prepare your acquisition and then you actually you know figure out a request for a proposal or FF RFP you get it out there when the suppliers come in with multiple uh, requests for proposal you know proposals I mean uh, you actually have to look between the various suppliers who gave you those proposals and try to evaluate which proposal is the best once you do that you initiate your agreement you monitor the agreement uh, that you said you know they're going to create this configuration item for you and then eventually they'll get it to you and you accept the product um, and of course you pay them eventually as well so these are the uh, steps you would take if you're not actually going to build or code but instead buy the configuration item let's uh, take a real quick look we're going to for this class we're going to look at 15288 We've already actually looked at this uh, on our second week when we talked about the context of system engineering. And I just want to go back um, fairly quickly and go through this. This is what we call an uh, input process output or IPO diagram. And the purpose of uh, what I want to show you here is the inputs, the activities, and the outputs for the implementation process, which actually is the purpose to actually realize the specific, uh, specified system element that you're interested in. So as you can see, the inputs are information in order to explain to us what we need to build. The activities are prepare, uh, perform, and manage uh, the actual implementation. And then the outputs uh, mainly are the system elements and the system element documents uh, that we have. So you could see them right here. Uh, those are the main things, but you do have some traceability documents and reports and records uh, as well. Here are some of the inputs. Uh, not only do you need to know about the concepts in terms of what you're trying to create, but mainly you need your system design uh, description and your uh, design traceability in order to give uh, your system architecture description and rationale in terms of what you're actually uh, going to create and that's where the system uh, element descriptions become uh, fairly handy uh, implementation wise we talked about this last week where you have to prepare for the implementation figure out what kind of fabrication procedures tools or equipment that you may use in order to figure out how to create this device. And then, of course, you actually do the coding and the hardware manipulation. Uh, don't forget code, code uh, peer reviews or hardware conformance uh, testing um, audits. We talked about that. And then, of course, any records uh, that are created from this implementation process, you need to manage those. So that's where you manage your results come in. From an output standpoint, your system elements and your element descriptions is your main things that are coming out. And um, you also have some traceability reports and records as well. Now, let's uh, quickly transition into integration. As you can see, we're going one step up from the implementation level. And where we're going to do now is actually think through the assembly and integration of all those little configuration items that you created. Uh, notice that I, I do the entire level because all the requirements and high level design now come into play when you start thinking about integration. So you're bringing the uh, components together uh, to create either the sub systems or elements that you need. Um, eventually you want to integrate everything together so that you have the system of course and you need to think about just like we did for implementation what kind of en enabling systems do you need uh, integration tools uh, do you need facilities are there equipment you need to verify that the configuration item is indeed uh, what you uh, spec'd it out to be uh, this is the time you actually focus mainly on those internal interfaces uh, while you're doing integration. 
Uh, and don't forget, you need to verify those elements with the um, uh, technical performance measures that you got through your um, element specs that you have. Here's the way 15.288 looks at integration. The purpose of integration is to synthesize a set of system elements into a realized system that satisfies system requirements, architecture, and design. So you'll actually see quite a bit of inputs that actually deal with the requirements, architecture, and design. Uh, the activities is prepare and of course perform uh, your integration and manage the results of your integration. And your outputs, we'll get into that, but your main thing would be an integrated system or system elements. So here are your inputs, mainly is your system elements and your system element description uh, documentation. They would go in, of course, prior to that, you would prepare for the integration, think of the, through uh, when uh, the various uh, configuration items are available, uh, when do you need them in order to get your assembly aggregations to work? Um, what kind of uh, systems, uh, subsystem elements do you want together? What kind of assembly procedures? What kind of enablers do you need? So those are all things you need to think through. Uh, but eventually you want to successfully, uh, successfully in integrate system element configurations until the complete system has been synthesized and, and it's actually together. And you record all the results of you uh, doing this integration just in case there's issues, you'd be able to uh, carry that further to the other processes like verification and even into the operation standpoint if need be. Your main output here is your integrated system or system elements they go into verification. There are some reports and records and other um, elements that help with some other processes as well. There's actually two ways to think about integration. This is the first one we're gonna look at, which is system build. What we're trying to do is address the system integration internal to the system. In other words, uh, we're trying to look at the integration of all the components comprising of the system and then build the system from a bottom-up perspective. And that's where the uh, components at the bottom of your hierarchy are integrated and tested, uh, and then you uh, continue until you're finished. Uh, these are steps that you would go through if you were just hired by the company and they threw you into an integration uh, scenario and you're like, what? Uh, if that happens, what you wanna do is obtain your system hierarchy where, you know, what, what is the functional block diagrams in square charts? In other words, learn about this system and how they split everything up. And then figure out all those interfacing subsystems and components, figure out the functions and physical uh, interface for those elements, uh, and then figure out how you would actually pull those together. And then you would organize your interface control documents or any drawings dealing with the interface and then work with your your product bill, uh, your productility and manufacturing groups, productility. This is uh, making it easy for product things. Sorry about that. Mm. I know you guys are laughing at me right now, but anyway. Uh, but you want to conduct your interface working group uh, from an internal standpoint. Make sure you have the relevant uh, engineering disciplines there. Review any test procedure or plans when it comes to verifying those interfaces. Audit your uh, interface designs. And uh, ensure that your interface changes have been incorporated into the specs as well. So this is built. these are all the steps you would do to build the system from the bottom up. The second way we would look at it, and we'll go through the task or steps you would go for this, they're very similar, but this is where you integrate this entire system that you have together, or you may even have subsystems that would actually interface with external systems. Um, so this, again, if you're hired and you have to start learning what the system is and its interfaces going through those functional charts, N-square charts, and other things 
that give you an understanding of what this system is. The other thing you want to do is determine uh, exactly what are those interfacing systems that you need to uh, think about that you're interfacing with and you review those items. As a matter of fact, you should be obtaining those um, interfacing systems if they have any interface control documents or system engineering plans, check them out and see how it is that you guys are going to um, eventually interface with each other. Look at the functions and, and physical interfaces with those external systems and start organizing your interface control documents with those interface. And now you would have uh, interface uh, control working groups when it comes to actually uh, with these external um, people. As a matter of fact, those are the times, those external systems, those are the times you would actually pull together what's called an interface control document you would meet with those external um, interface um, program and you would actually meet with them and work in order to actually develop the ICD. Normally, uh, somebody has chosen one side or the other, actually creates the interface control document, and then the others would help you refine it and make it appropriate that where you can actually get all the parties to sign it, including the program managers of the various um, programs that are creating these systems. Um, don't forget to review your test procedures and plans to verify those interfaces, audit whatever interface designs are there, and incorporate the changes that need to be created uh, into your specification. Okay, so that's um, integration. Once you have this system together, now you want to think about verification. As you can see, we're going one level up and now we have to think about verification requirements so in 15288 they actually talks about the verification process confirms that the system of interest and all the elements perform their intended function and meet the performance requirements allocated to them in other words has the system been built right uh, and it's this time that you would actually confirm through whatever objective evidence you can um, gather that the specific requirements for this system that you were supposed to build has been fulfilled. And remember one of the things we looked at is characteristics of a good requirement. Remember one of those myths that we uh, thought about when it came to requirements. We're not so much worried about the testability although that becomes one of the issues if you have a requirement that can be tested. But there are other ways where you can actually verify a system. Um, but what does it mean when you actually do a verif uh, verifiability assessment? That's the measure of quality of the, of the product requirement. Is it verifiable? You actually look at it and you actually come up with a, verify, a verification cross reference matrix and as you start verifying these various functions or aspects to your system you would actually start completing this VCRM. So five require, uh, verification requirement attributes. What is the purpose of your verification? That becomes your objective. What methods do you propose to uh, be done during this time frame? That's your method. What kind of environmental conditions will it be under? That's your environment. Are there special conditions that you need to create uh, document? And also what kind of uh, expectation, uh, expected success criteria are going to take place? So all those should be part of your verification planning. Uh, verification activities, we talked back, back here we talked about what is a good characteristics. One of the um, aspects there is each requirement must be verified to some level at one of four standard methods, ins inspection, analysis, demonstration, or test. And that's what we've got here. Inspection, that's where you actually take the device or system and you actually look at it and see if it meets the criteria you were thinking about. Analysis is actually where you get some data, sometimes data that's accomplished through 
perhaps simulation or testing, uh, you may actually have some test data that would come into play as well. But basically you're taking uh, data and simulations and you're analyzing it to see if it meets uh, the requirement that you have in place. Testing, of course, is where you actually put in special test equipment, probes, and instrumentation, and you actually try to think through, um, you know, I'm putting all these probes in, you run the system, and the probe will give you some data to see if you met the criteria. Demonstration mainly happens during validation, uh, but it can happen at ver verification, too, at a lower level, but that's where you just demonstrate if the system actually performs whatever uh, you expected it to do uh, while, you're, um, while the system is running. Uh, I have two other things that we were looking at. We had those four, which is uh, inspection, analysis, and test, and demonstration. We also have certification. That's where if you have an actual specification and you want to make sure that you're, you're meeting that spec, uh, you would send it perhaps to the people who created that specification and they would certify that indeed your system uh, runs according to the specification. So think about your phone, you have a Bluetooth that hooks to your car radio. Well, that Bluetooth needs to be certified uh, that it is running the Bluetooth specs. So certification uh, has to be done not only on the um, phone manufacturer, but for the car as well. They both need to get certified in order to make sure that the Bluetooth will work. Last but not least, verification is verification by similarity where you actually say, hey, you know, I got 90% of this system already out, out in the field. Um, I'm just changing this 10%. We'll just uh, take what we've already got and we use that to verify, yes, this will work. And then we'll just test demonstrate or inspect or analyze the other 10%. You should be thinking about a cross verification cross reference matrix. As you can see here is an example where you have the product requirement. And then you come in and actually develop an objective for that requirement, verific your verification objective for that requirement. And what are your pa pl pass fail criteria in order for you to understand if you succeed or not. And here's how you would do it. You would have a paragraph and you would say, am I going to do ex uh, examination, analysis, demo, or test? And I mark down what I'm going to do in order to actually uh, verify this requirement when you have the whole system created, right? So you identify verification metrics that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You have to also think about um, other aspects um, of your cross-reference uh, matrix. System engineers are the ones that actually translate operational objectives into these product requirements and then design, assess those requirements, implementation, and your testing organization may pr uh, provide that assessment of the vi valid the um, verifiability of your requirement. As you get into your verification um, objectives, your system engineer is helping you uh, with that compliance, but you have a verification implementation group. They can advise you to make sure these objectives make sense. And of course, your traceability assurance comes through uh, your verification cross-reference uh, matrix. Here's an excellent example of a verification requirement where it actually talks about proving and then they actually have the, the requirement in here. Prove the product's communication system is capable of communicating with ground uh, command team. And then you say buy and you say, well, what kind of method are we going to do? This actually talks about doing a test within a certain environment. And what, what will that environment be? It will be shown that you can transmit and receive audio at all frequencies. And what kind of criteria are we talking about? It's where they, uh, the frequencies are represented by standard ground recovery forces. So that's how you would actually um, 
think about what a uh, verification requirement is. As a matter of fact, what I'd love you to do, uh, we've been talking for quite a while here, uh, you can take a break uh, as you uh, pull up the other um, uh, video here. But what I want you to do is uh, get together with your team, try to communicate them through email, and to actually perhaps work together in order to uh, think of one requirement that came from your Microsoft Future System and actually start creating a verification requirement. It'd be good for us to do this. Uh, I want you to upload it into the file exchange for the class file upload area, not your group file exchange. I want you to put it into the class file upload area, okay? It's different than your group. Now, what you'll be doing is taking, uh, this is your template. You can find the template on Blackboard, download it and start working together to figure out what your objective method environment and success criteria would be involved. And on top of that, please write down any type of enabling tools you feel you'll need in order to perform uh, this object, you know, verification. All right, so with that in mind, um, uh, go ahead and do that. I'm gonna stop now and I'll catch you on the next video.